Back to my garden episode 18. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Do you love perennial flowers? Get a free catalog and 10% off your first order of bulbs at Bloom and Bulb. I set up a special link just for podcast listeners. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash bulb for your unique bonus. This episode of Back to My Garden is sponsored by Coffee Royalty. Can you really lose 5, 10, even 20 pounds or more just by switching your coffee or tea? Find out how to drink it for free at www.backtomygarden.com front slash coffee. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux. Welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. Today, gardening royalty. What a guest we have for you. <laughs> He's the executive producer and host of Growing a Greener World on PBS. For my international listeners, that's a major American TV network. He's an organic gardening enthusiast, a green living and playing in dirt specialist, author, syndicated columnist. He's a podcaster, new media expert. I could go on and on, but the sooner I get through the intro, the sooner I can start asking him questions. Uh, Joe Lample, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. As soon as I stop smiling and laughing, I'll be able to answer you. That was funny. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate being here. I'm relatively new to this whole world, but everybody has been saying, oh, you got to talk to Joe Lample. Oh, gosh. I know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if this was the cooking world or yeah. the home building world, these are major television uh, niches now with literally celebrities in those categories. And in yeah. the gardening world on television... I consider you royalty. <laughs> Thank you. We have listeners, though, that don't know your story. Wow. I'm sure they want to get to know you a little bit. Can you take a minute and talk a little bit about your background? I would be happy to do that. Everybody loves to talk about themselves, right? Absolutely. I, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and everything grows down there. So you don't have to be you know, exceptionally green with your thumb to have success. But for me, it was an accidental experience where I at eight years old, broke a branch off of one of my dad's plants. Now, he wasn't a gardener, but he liked his landscape to be tidy and healthy. So I didn't want to get caught at that. So as I imagine you would do as well, Dave, is what do we do? We take the broken branch and we cover our tracks. We stick it in the ground right next to the rest of the plant and cover it up with some dirt and hope we don't get caught. And, uh, and so that's what I did. But the moment for me that really hooked me was about roughly 10 weeks later when I went back by that plant and just to check on that branch and it wasn't dead or it didn't appear to be. In fact, little things were growing out of it, you know, little sprouts. And I, I had to do a double take. And then I ultimately went up to it and examined it and even tugged on it a little bit and noticed that it had started to form some new roots. And I, I, this was all new to me. No one had ever taught me this yet. And I didn't know this could even happen or it was possible, but, um, it amazed me. I was just really hooked on that. And so I went from there to propagating all kinds of plants and literally on purpose breaking things off or cutting things off and sticking them back in water or dirt to see if they would also propagate themselves. And more often than not, they did. And I couldn't get enough of that. And so as I got older, uh, my curiosity grew bigger. And, uh, you know, I ultimately had a, a little nursery business and then, of course, the landscaping business and the mowing business. And I, you know, went and, and pursued education with horticulture and business. My mother encouraged me to get a dual degree because there would be more opportunities for business than probably horticulture. And she was right coming out of school. I mean, that was more people wanted a business background than the plant background. But fortunately, all paths led back for me to gardening, which is where I, ne I never left it in my heart. And I always loved doing it in all my free time, but I had a professional life there for a year, uh, years, but I had a TV opportunity that came about through DIY network. They were, they were starting a brand new show about growing food and everything was in place except the host and the title of the show. So they did a big, long national search, and uh, I'd never been on television before, but somebody got this big email blast, and they forwarded it to me and said, Joe, this sounds like you, who they're looking for and who they're describing. So I was able to persuade the producer to meet with me, 
and that ultimately led to a lunch, a very awkward lunch, I should say. I had no idea. I could not read this guy. I didn't know if he liked me or what. And I didn't hear from him for a week. It, you know, it was one of those send-offs where it's don't call us, we'll call you, and if we're interested, we'll let you know. And I didn't hear anything for a week, but then I did. And then they wanted me to meet them the next day for a screen test. And I did that, and it was very awkward because they stuck mics and cameras and all this stuff in front of my face and then had me do a few things over and over with zero feedback. And I mean zero, not that was terrible or that was great or try it again. All all they did was have me do it over and over. And it was very awkward, but uh, I did what they asked me, and then they asked me to do something spontaneous that I was not prepared for, and they wanted to just see how I could think on my feet, I think. So they had me do that a few times. And, um, you know, ultimately they had their big meeting up at HGTV to present all the candidates they had been looking at. Uh, I didn't hear from them, so I called them and asked them how I do, thinking I didn't do very well. And he told me they narrowed it. They, they liked me a lot, but they were going to go back to the drawing board and do females to, to do all – all this all over with females. So I knew that was going to take another eight months, or eight weeks, I should say, and it did. And then they called me back and said, uh, they've narrowed it down to two people. There's a female they're looking at, and they actually like you as the male. So depending on which gender they go with, they will. Uh, that's how they'll pick the host. And a week later, they called me and said they picked the male, which means they picked me. And that changed everything. I became. I went from a business professional in a fancy office downtown to a guy that wears jeans and a t-shirt most of the time, talking about gardening for a living, which was awesome. And so, uh, you know, that was 12 years ago, and I've been on television ever since doing that uh, for three different television shows. Now, the last is the one I created five years ago called Growing a Greener World, and that's that's where my heart is, and, and I'm loving it. Long, long answer. I'm sorry about that, no, but that's no. the story. <laughs> I guess in the television world, it's a hurry-up-and-wait environment with uh, lots of moving parts, and in the podcasting world, it just lets go. Which is why I love podcasting so much. You know, I, I love audio, I think, more than video. And, and, and television production is a is a beast. I don't care what subject you're covering. I mean, there's just all the nuances to it that just seem to take forever. Uh, podcasting, what an awesome medium. That's why you're doing it, why I'm doing it. And I think it's a better opportunity to connect with your audience more intimately. You know, it's, it's more unscripted and just all those good things. But I'm getting off topic. But anyway, yeah, no, I, I love podcasting. For those of you driving your car, keep both hands on the wheel. I'll put Joe's links in the show notes. For those of you taking notes at home, make sure you head over to Joe's website. It's www.growingagreenerworld.com. You can also follow Joe on Twitter. He has a huge Twitter following at Joe Gardener. Make sure you spell Gardener right. Uh, Thank you. I forget the E in the middle sometimes. So does everybody else. And and when they do and they send an email to at Joe Gardener and they forget that E, it goes to a CPA in Texas who has become a good friend of mine because he gets so much of my mail. Uh, And he's actually invited me. He got one of my errant emails, uh, and he saw that I was coming to uh, his town. And uh, so he said, listen, I didn't mean to to be snoop, uh, you know, check out your email, but I saw you're coming. Let's get together for dinner. So because of all the misspellings, he gets those, and uh, we've become friends because of it. I've been going through your website, and I want to ask you a non- gardening related question but relating to social media and new media yeah. you've taken to this really well yeah uh, in 12 years how have you seen these tools and the ability to leverage and meet people change so much it's awesome it, it's everything in fact uh we we're looking at social media as uh as our hub for everything else so television although you would think you know with uh a million viewers a week on my show and a hundred thousand broadcasts of my episodes so far, uh, since we've been doing it, that would be the focus. And, and, and not to say that it's not, but if you look towards the future and from where we've come in just the last few years, social media is where you're able to connect closely with those people that really care about what you have to say. And, uh, for them to hear your voice or for them to be able to interact with you conversationally online and potentially get something back rather quickly is awesome. And it's, you know, it's, it's what you want to say. It's who you are. It's the real, and that's the beauty of it. You know, it doesn't have to be as polished as television. And I think that's what people like. They want to see, you know, who you really are and what you're really about. And I think social media gives you that medium and podcasting the same versus television. Uh, you know, you're really kind of under the watch of 
the Federal Communications Commission and the sponsors and all of this other stuff. And so candidly, when, you know, I'm hosting my own show, even though it is my own show, I still have a lot of people and organizations to answer to and expectations that have to be met. And the truth of the matter is I'm a little more buttoned up on television than I really am in person. But social media, video, podcasting allows me to be who I really am. Now, I think I, I don't I'm not saying that I'm not who you see on television because I am. I mean, I would not have it any other way. But I let my hair down and leave it a little bit more when it's not, you know, the polished television show. And that's what social media does. It just allows you to connect with those people more intimately. Excellent. I want to drill down because first time gardeners listening to this, they're in their car and their garden is on a patio in their condo building with three containers. And they yep. look at you, Joe, with your experience and reach, maybe a little intimidating. I want to take you back your first garden as an adult. Because there's always a lap between being a gardener as a kid or a teenager mm-hmm. and an adult. What was that like for you? What did it look like? Uh, and what was the challenge when you got started? The um, the challenge for me is, you know, perfection. I, I'm, you know, I got, I'm guilty of that, wanting to be a perfectionist. So if it's not good enough, it's almost like, well, do I even bother? And that's the hurdle that I had to get over. And I think a lot of people struggle with. And with gardening, there is never going to be perfection. You know, it's progress, but it's never perfection. And you are never, ever going to be in full control because Mother Nature will squash you like a bug. You know, she'll remind you quickly who's really in control. So all you all you can do is adapt and learn from your experiences. And so that's – once I got to that realization – I became a much more relaxed gardener and I was willing to try so many new things or anything. And, and, and actually because of the successes and the challenges, I was going to say failures, but they're not, they're challenges. I learned so much more when I allowed, you know, more levity into the whole scenario. And, uh, and I, and I became a much better gardener. So for me, I think the first adult garden I had was maybe a, a, a bed in my front yard or my side yard where I had, you know, a little bit of room and a little bit of sunlight and I could, you know, try things. And frankly, you know, I tried things that needed full sun that didn't get full sun. Uh, and I saw that I didn't have, you know, great success, but I learned why and I was able to apply, you know, what I'd learned to the next thing. And then I had more success. And, you know, we all need to do that. It's okay to make mistakes. All we need to do is just learn from them and apply that information to the next thing. And that's when you really start to take off. I'm finding the gardening world is very sharing driven. I mean, if this was 30 years ago, I'd have to go to a library and borrow a book. And here you are sharing with our listeners. And we connect through our mistakes. Can you think of what I call a catastrophic oopsie? where you did something that was just not what you expected, and now you can look back humorously and share it. Yeah. And in fact, it's interesting you asked me that. I just wrote about that for my column a couple of weeks ago, and it, was, it goes back a lot of years ago. But I remember I was um, wanting to eliminate the very few weeds that were in my almost picture-perfect lawn. You know, when I was really into lawns and I really wanted it to look good, and I am talking a long time ago, uh, I was having a party in a week or so. And I just, you know, God forbid there was another weed out there. So I felt like I was going to give it one more hit of herbicide to knock out the weeds. So I ran to the, the nursery and I grabbed a bag of uh, the lawn weed killer. Didn't really, didn't really look at the bag, just, you know, glanced at it and put it in my car and came home and put it in my spreader and went out there and did my thing. And so the next morning I walked out there thinking, wow, maybe I'll be able to see the effects already, you know? And so I did. And rather than seeing, you know, a couple weeds wilting, I saw everywhere where my head, my spreader had gone, all of that was turning yellow to brown because I bought the wrong weed killer. I bought weed killer that wasn't designed for the type of grass that I was growing. And instead of killing the weeds, the the herbicide was killing everything. And so it was just this uh uh-oh moment. And then uh, it was a real wake-up call for me to say, wait a minute, you know, what am I doing really? Why am I doing this? Why am I trying to pursue that? And look at what the impact of this persistent or this relatively, you know, non-harmful chemical is really doing. And if it's doing this to the grass, what else is it doing? And that's just an herbicide. Pesticides are far worse. And so that was probably the catalyst for me of a, of a uh-oh moment 
long time ago that I used to change everything I do about how I garden, which led me to really being an all-organic gardener. Fantastic. Now we're on a tangent that I am absolutely passionate about because when I was a kid in the 70s and early 80s, no, kids did not have asthma. There was no such thing as peanut allergies. You could mm-hmm. bring peanut butter to your school and not get sent to the principal's office. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen over the last X number of years that you've been gardening? The conversation is changing, especially around the green concept. Can you speak a little bit about that and, and how that ties into your passion for gardening? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I just appreciate nature so much. And when I have learned what, you know, these chemicals do at the expense of nature. You know, we're we're just still, many of us trying to pursue that perfect garden or a bug, bugless or weed-free garden, and it's just not going to happen. But in the course of applying those chemicals, you know, we might get a temporary fix, but let me tell you, it's only temporary. But along the way, the impact that that's having on the environment is bad news. Now, the good news is that I think more people are cluing into that now than ever before. And this generation that's coming up, the millennials that are coming up, you know, they're they're starting to garden in mass. And they're really coming to it through the back door. It's not as though they, like, had a parent or a grandparent that gardened. Chances are they really didn't because many of their parents are two-income wage earners and they're so busy. I mean, fewer of the baby boomers are gardening than ever before. So the millennials are coming at it maybe from the fact that they're foodies and they want to have more control over, you know, the food that they're eating and the flavors and the freshness and the, and the nutrition. But at the same time, they also want to control the fact that they're not, uh, you know, consuming food miles from food that's traveled 2000 miles away or chemicals or pesticides that are going into their body when they have a way to take control over that. So, what better way to do that than to grow their own food? So we're seeing a lot more younger people entering the gardening world, even in an urban area, which is really cool because the largest area of growth or one of the largest in gardening is in the on the urban side where they may be that person that has that deck or only that patio and those three containers. And yet they can still grow food or some herb or something because it works and Breeders are developing plants that are more adapted to smaller spaces and containers. And so we're learning more, and the response has been great from the growers and the breeders all the way through to the end user, which in this case is that younger generation that is so essential to the future of this industry. Fantastic. I see people getting into gardening, and they don't – gardening is a big concept. I love vegetables, heirloom tomatoes. Other people love growing flowers. For my wife, it's almost therapeutic. I see her almost singing, you know, a tune when she's gardening. Mm -hmm. You're around people all over America now. What is gardening doing for the people out there from a almost like a spiritual perspective or a recharge, re-energize perspective? It's building community. It's bringing people together. You know, the thing about gardening is that it's not so much the act of gardening as, as it is the space or the garden itself and what the garden does for the people that are, whether they're in it or around it, there's something spiritual or supernatural about that space in that area that just brings people together. And statistically, we know for a fact that when you put a community garden or a common garden space into an area that traditionally has had high crime or, you know, violent area, the garden really brings everything back sort of into line and in order and it improves the statistics on the crime rates and all of that and um you meet your neighbors you get out of your house you socialize you you get one with nature i mean i know i'm sounding a little corny there but it's true i mean we don't i mean you know this dave how many people today default to their devices or their computer or their phone or their television when the garden is where we need to spend more time. That's where we heal. That's where people connect and crime goes down. And so thankfully, we're seeing more of that. And people are realizing the benefits of a garden. And there are so many. I mean, it is spiritually healing. It's physically healing. And it builds community. And that's what we need today. And that's what gardens are doing. Fantastic. I get to talk to a lot of gardeners and I ask them about the scene where they live in terms of community plots or in, in England, they called it allotments. Yeah. 
uh, my friend Chelly was uh, over number 700 on the waiting list in L.A. Mm. For, for a plot. So somebody's gardening. Uh, I know you've moved from Florida to Georgia. Mm-hmm. What's the gardening scene like in Georgia? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. You know, we have uh, a climate that a lot of people would be envious of because we literally can garden year round. Now we get, you know, down into the single digits occasionally in the wintertime, but that's the exception to the norm. And uh, the summers are probably not as pleasant to be outside, but uh, there's no shortage of sun or heat. And and that's what, you know, summer crops love for sure. But it never gets all that cold that you can't be growing something year round. And we're not buried under snow. And and so you would think that more people in this area would be avid gardeners. Like when I think of a town of avid gardeners, I think of Seattle, for example, or Philadelphia, uh, where it's a lot, you know, rainier in Seattle and a lot colder in Philadelphia. I would think Atlanta would just be the perfect place for people to really get their hands in the dirt. But it just hasn't seemed to catch on. To put it into perspective, my show is on in um, 49 states in the U.S., and it's in Canada a lot. Uh, and I'm from Atlanta, live in Georgia. Guess what state uh, growing a greener world is not being carried in? <laughs> you can't be serious. I Believe me, I wish I wasn't serious, but I am. And so I have had conversations with the big shots at both PBS stations, and that's this public television network in Atlanta, and this consensus is, well, you know, one station said, well, we already have two shows and we don't want to add another because we don't think there's a demand for it. The other station said, we don't think there's a demand at all for gardening or green living shows. So we don't really have any plans to carry your show. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, but that's the answer I get. And here that is in the Southeast in Atlanta, where you would think that's just, that's impossible to hear something like that from both the stations, but that's that's what I hear. Yeah. And the flower show, the big, you know, we used to have a big flower show, but that's waned. And so we don't even really have anything that shows up on the map as far as a major flower show like Philadelphia or the Northwest Flower Show in Seattle, for example. So um, we've got a ways to go here in the southeast. Nothing but opportunity. Right. Well, thank you. I, I like the way you think. Yes. Good, good. Now, I want to talk to Joe the man, not Joe the TV star. Joe the man I know you're super busy. You you got so many projects on the go. This season, what is your personal garden like? And uh, what is most exciting to you in your garden? My personal garden is a large 16-bed raised garden inside of a, a split rail fence, 42 feet by 74 feet. So it's a nice, big, lovely garden in full sun. That would take a lot of manpower, man, people hours to maintain on a weekly basis because it's fully planted out. Because of my busy schedule, I am blessed with a uh, college horticulture senior intern student that comes every day and spends probably about six hours pretty much just in that space because there's so much to do. It, we're exploding with produce. We have tomatoes busting at the seams. We have you know, pretty much all the classic summer crops going strong. And so all we do, all she does, and all I do too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm active out there a lot, but when I'm away, I can't be obviously. So we spend a lot of time maintaining bug patrol is big for us. You know, I'm a firm believer as an organic gardener, the best way to reduce the bug population or the pest population in your garden is to be out there every day, proactively looking for them under the leaves, on top of the leaves and taking them out in the early life stage. So they don't have a chance to really, you know, propagate. And so we're very effective with that, but it takes, it does take more time, but you know, that's kind of therapeutic too, because you're just chilling in the garden early in the morning and you, it's kind of fun. It's a little bit of a hunt. Uh, so we do that and we, we, uh, we're cutting out diseases as they come up on the leaves. You know, we're taking out, we're cutting out leaves and removing them from the garden to keep our garden healthy and diseases from spreading. Watering, uh, you know, we're constantly keeping an eye on the water. We don't overwater, but we, uh, we keep tabs on that. And then, you know, to keep things tidy so so pests don't really have a, a great place to overwinter, hide out. You know, it just uh, in a garden that size, in as much as we have planted, that's what it takes. And so what am I most excited about? I live for, uh, I live for the mornings, early mornings when I'm in town 
and always on the weekends, uh, I have, you know, my time in the garden early in the mornings out there when the sun is just breaking, still kind of dark. The, you know, you hear the chickens all around and um, the birds are chirping. And I'm telling you, it's an amazing experience. So it's that in the morning and similar at night, maybe with a glass of wine and coffee in the morning. But, uh, you know, I just love being out there. I don't care what time of day it is, but uh, I just love being in the garden. For those of you stuck in your car in rush hour traffic listening to this, uh, Joe's idyllic, living the dream, <laughs> and be inspired by it because that's what we aspire to, right? Yeah. Our half hour is rapidly getting away from us, and now is the time in the show when we get to play my favorite game, Five Quick Questions. Okay. This is where you get to share wisdom and experience with beginning gardeners. Are you yep. ready to play? Let's do it. Number one, in your opinion... What do you think stops most people from getting into gardening? Uh, I, I think they overthink it. I, I, they're afraid to start because they, they think they'll fail. And uh, the only failure is not starting. So you have to just do it. And hopefully you do make mistakes as long as you learn from them. So just doing it and, uh, and you'll connect. But, but feel good about your mistakes because you'll learn from them. Brilliant. Uh, number two. What is the single best piece of gardening advice you've ever personally received? Uh, the single best one would be uh, put the right plant in the right place. And the reason for that is, if, uh, the, you know, plants are genetically predisposed to want to grow and to thrive and to reproduce itself. And so it's going to try with all its might to do that, to get to that point. And if we put it in the right environment, uh, it will for the most part. But it, the right environment includes the second greatest thing I ever heard, and that is to improve the soil and let the feed the soil and let the soil feed the plant. So work on developing the soil. But if you do those two things, right plant, right place, and feed the soil, nurture the soil and let the soil feed the plants, you'll eliminate 95% of the problems that you would likely have otherwise if you were to plant it improperly or not consider the soil as much. Fantastic. Now, number three. Obviously, every listener should go right now to www.growingagreenerworld.com. It's an incredible resource. But, Joe, if you had just two websites to share with a rookie gardener, mm. what would those websites be? Okay. Um, I, I I don't have a, even a single website, and I'm, I'm not even going to put mine in the list because, obviously, that would be sound biased. But um, I when I go to a website, and I'm going to websites all the time, I'm not looking for any particular website. I'm looking for um, a, a site that I believe is academically based, first of all. So for me, that would I, I look for the university sites or the extension service sites that um, I believe have academic backing behind it. And so you're not going to get some sort of personal bias. Not that that's wrong, but uh, I feel a research-based site, the, i.e. a university or extension-based site, is where I'm going to go to first. And I never know who that's going to be. But, okay, I just thought of one. It is university. The Missouri Botanical Gardens website, MOBOT, M-O-B-O-T, or just Missouri Botanical Garden, is an incredible website. Same thing with Ohio State University. Awesome websites with tons of information for beginning or experienced gardener. But you go for, you know, from there, you just, you know, that'll get you on the right path and you'll find others. But so university-based. Yeah, I love it. And those of you jogging, listening to your iPad or iPhone, don't worry about it. I'll put the links in the show notes. Uh, number four, I'm in my third season growing organic heirloom vegetables, primarily tomatoes. What's uh, a gardening book that you can recommend that I read this year? For me, that would be my go-to guide all the time. It's kind of like my Bible, but that it's Rodale's Organic Guard, uh, ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. That's it. Rodale's Ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. Uh, they're a trusted source. They're a long time. I mean, they're really the pioneers of organic gardening, and uh, they put out really good and accurate content. So that would be uh, that would be my book for that. Um, so many great guides out there today, but. But another one, to get you thinking about the cause and effect of some of our actions, not only today but in the past and looking ahead, Rachel Carson, one of my favorite books ever was Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Uh, I think it was written in the late 50s, early 60s. But, uh, you know, it's one of those books you almost cry when you put it down because you finished it. You know, you just don't want it to be over. But along the ways you read that book, it's, uh, it's sad in a lot of ways. But it also it's inspirational because of you know the impact that she had on on changing things for the better. 
uh, and I think we all need to make that uh, a must read. If we care about the environment, we're into gardening. Silent Spring by Rachel Carson is a must read. I'm realizing I'm going to have to start a book club. Yeah, Rachel you do. Carson, Silent yeah. Spring. Okay, yeah. and number five. You've been on the edge of gardening now. You know the trends. You can kind of predict the future. What's the number one thing, in your opinion, that every gardener should try to grow next season? Um, I would – how about this? Can we say every what, – what should every gardener try to make next season? Because uh, – you know, growing is so subjective and, and we all have our preferences. For me, it would be tomatoes and they're always tricky. You know, every year is different. But for me, I think every gardener should try to make compost, which goes in the garden and then makes everything in the garden grow better. Compost is the single best ingredient we can put into the soil and it's feeding the soil so the soil can feed the plants. But so many people don't compost because it goes back to what I said earlier. They they kind of get overwhelmed thinking it's more complicated than it really is. But in nature, compost happens. You know, it's just – it's things – it's organic matter rotting to a point that it becomes unrecognizable. And when it's unrecognizable, it's exactly where it needs to be for you to put it in your garden because it's full of all the primary and micro, micronutrients that you need as well as beneficial organisms that are going to help your plants grow and they're going to fight diseases and we can make it for free. That's the best part. And we're keeping that waste from going into the landfill, which is another biggie. So there's no reason not to do it. The only sad thing is we probably can't make as much as we would like from just the inputs that we have in our own house. But that doesn't mean you should not try. Just throw that stuff in a pile and let it go and and make compost. Fantastic. Well, dear listener, I told you this was going to be a great episode. Make sure you check out Joe's website at www.growingagreenerworld.com. And please follow and share on social media. Joe's on Twitter at Joe Gardener. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm going to give you the last word. Can you share with our listeners either a note of encouragement or a pearl of wisdom? Thank you, Dave, for having me. And um, I would say that if you if you haven't gardened yet or you're just you know starting to get into it, what's stopping you or what's keeping you from doing more? Don't take on too much at once because the worst thing you can probably do is dive in too deep and you're over your head. Because if you do it right with good soil and you put the right plant in the right place, your plants are going to take off. And they're probably going to grow faster and larger than you ever anticipated. And, you know, that can create the opposite problem where you become overwhelmed. And so, you know, take take gardening in bite-sized pieces, but take the first bite. You know, Joe, on behalf of my listeners, I want to say thank you. You are being appreciated out there. I know you're working hard, and you're literally changing lives with your show. And we want you to know how much you are appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, very much. I appreciate it. All of the links, resources, and websites mentioned in this episode will be posted at www.backtomygarden.com front slash 18.